God bless you, beloved. Once again, Dr. Schaefer, the pastor of Inner Seed Christian Center, located at 414 Thompson Avenue, the beautiful city of West Memphis. To God Almighty be the glory, great things that he has done. Beloved, let me first encourage you. In this season that we're in, there are so many things that seem like they're going wrong around us. But you have to learn to trust that God is yet still in control. The Lord dropped inside of my spirit a sermon that came again from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through verses 30. That's entitled, What's the Night Before? Let's go into the sanctuary here with us, says the Lord. Come on, let's go. Oh, holy night, the stars are bright. to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast her mind in what manner of salutation this should be. Verse 30. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of your Son, Jesus, we thank you for this day. We give you glory, we give you praise and reverence. We ask, Lord God, that you would bless our minds, our thoughts, whereas we are focused upon you, O oh God, and the great gift that you've given us. We ask, Lord God, that you would touch and allow us, Lord God, to see things as you see. We give you reverence in advance for this word, and it may go forth with power and authority. If no demon in hell, nothing will prevent it, O oh God, from reaching this intended time. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, beloved. Amen. Amen. I just read to you Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 33. I want to minister to you from a topic line that's entitled, Plus the Night Before. In 1823, an artist, Arthur, by the name of Clement Clark Moore, wrote the most famous secular Christmas poem that we know of that was titled, A Visit from St. Nicholas. More commonly known today as the night before Christmas. And twas the night before Christmas from its first line is what we really know it as. In the poem, the father of the children spoke. 
of how exciting it was that the secular celebration of Christmas had been so ingrained in his children that their excitement had him excited. Now this poem is a celebration of the greed which substituted the purpose behind Christmas and the one gift which is to be valued. And we know that one gift is Jesus the Christ. This is a special season of the year. In theological circles, it's called Christmas Tide. Uh, and as special as it is over the years, it has moved from the commemoration of the birth of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It has moved from the commemoration of the birth of the gift of God gave to the world to a steady onslaught of commercialization, to a steady onslaught of people being greedy and selfish within themselves. It has moved from its original purpose to this. Jesus, the reason for this season and all seasons, has taken the back seat to Santa Claus. As parents are more apt to teach their children the story of an oversized elf blessing them than they are the story of Emmanuel and his journey to the earth. They're more apt to teach their children about the virtues of receiving more so than the virtues of giving. Parents are more apt to tell their children to look underneath the tree for a gift, whereas the gift of life, Jesus the Christ, is readily available to them for a relationship. We have reached a dark time in history. Was the night before. We're in a dark time in history. As darkness now has reached its peak. It's reached its peak. Oh, my God, my God. We are bombarded with falsely created demand and a desire from our children to buy them the latest toy, the latest electronic gadget, the latest clothing. We are bombarded by the selfish nature with the in-ground, ingrained selfish nature of desire to care more about self than to care about others. Amen. And we, we are in, ingrained with this and it's, it's a sad state of affairs. Anybody ever notice that Christmas advertising is moving closer and closer to Easter? It's getting closer and closer to the summer. I was somewhere and I saw a large grill beside the Christmas toy displays. It was several months ago and I thought but for a moment that the grill was a gift recommendation. But I found out that it was simply a Labor Day sale for the grill in the beginning of Christmas advertising season for the store. So on this morning, I want you to look at the phrase towards the night before and consider what it means in terms of before Jesus. It's fitting that we do so uh, we do so as many It's fitting that many of us have forgotten the reason for the season. It's fitting as, as the, the reason for the season Jesus has been subjugated to really just another reason for people to receive and, and give and eat and give. Uh, but the phrase that we find before Jesus, the world, the world was full that night. That night, the world was full that night. Now let's look now beyond our current state. With the world as horrible as it seems now. There was a time when the world was a whole lot worse during the time that Jesus the Christ was born. Before Jesus, the entire world, except for the Jews, were blindly seeking after their own selves, blindly seeking after their own paganistic gods. The Gentile nations, based on the part of the Holy Spirit in each and every one of us, uh, uh, were seeking themselves, and, and they were seeking the greater inside of themselves and not seeking the greatness that God intended for them to have. They saw God's status among their leaders. They called uh, Julius Caesar was called a God. He was treated as a God. Pharaoh was called a God. He was treated as a God. They saw God's status among their leaders. They looked to their leaders for everything. They looked to their leaders for their food, their clothing, their water. They looked to their leaders for their healing. They looked to their leaders for everything that was related to their lives. Further, we have in this time period where it's the demons or fallen angels created gods with a little g, all in an effort to avert worship to themselves. 
In both efforts, elements of the truth were perverted and used to give validity to the lie. Now among the children of Israel, the search for God had ceased and they were blind. The promise of a redeemer given to Adam and Eve after the fall in Genesis 3 and 15 became more concrete in Abraham through whom God promised that all nations would be blessed. The promise was reiterated to Isaac and then it was reiterated to Jacob who later became Israel. While we think of Christmas as a season of light, the truth is the birth of uh, the birth story of Jesus Christ is filled with darkness. It's filled with darkness. The birth story does not begin in the New Testament books of Matthew, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as one would suppose. Nor does it begin in the book of Isaiah, not even in the Mosaic books, rather, or the book of Isaiah. The story of his birth came forward to our hearing in Genesis 3 when God made a promise, a promise to return mankind to his place of dimension. The very light in this world had now become dominated with darkness, spiritual darkness, was the night before. In that period between the garden fall and the coming of Christ was about 4,000 years or so. In that time period, demonic possession, demon possession, and other activities were commonplace. It was so common that in the Old Testament, demon activity is mentioned more than any place in the Bible, more than in the New Testament. And why wouldn't it be as people worship and they sold seeds to the flesh and the demonic things, things such as human sacrifice, or especially babies and virgins were the end thing to do. As it seems that even today that that seems to be the end thing to do with the scourge of abortion being so rapidly brought up being so easily accepted. Even, even preachers today, some preachers today are accepting of the pro-choice which is a lie straight from the pit of hell. In that time period the conjuring of demons were common. Common. Conjuring of demons to allow possession, abominations such as bestiality were common. Temple prostitution, homosexuality uh, did, did not have to be hidden. There was an open defiance to the Lord God Almighty. As it seems to be today, there's open defiance in the world to the things of God. There's open defiance against marriage. There's open defiance against uh, the saving of a child's life. There's open defiance against things of God. God, that God clearly said should not happen. These things are happening and people are embracing and openly embracing these things. The scope of the activity far exceed the scope of the activity in the Old New Testament. The scope of activity during that time period far exceed the scope of the activity in the New Testament. It was widely reported among the prophets such as Daniel who faced opposition from the prince of Persia, a regional team, and it was widely reported among the prophets. Further, Ezekiel describes the enemy having possession of the king of Tyre, and, and, and these were people of renown who suffered, but the common people were not even mentioned. Yet we know that the same as God, the enemy is not a respecter of person. His ways are described as non-discriminatory in Job 1, where Satan comes to God and, and he tells God, uh, give me an opportunity to deal with Job and I'll make Job curse you to your face. The enemy asked God, said, what have you been doing, knucklehead? And he said, I've been walking through and from the earth, looking for whom I may devour, walking up and down. In other words, I'm looking for whom I can destroy, who I can steal from, who I can kill, and who I can destroy. And all that he can devour, regardless of their station of life, he did not care what they were rich or poor. He was more concerned with taking their identity from them, removing them from underneath the covering that God had over them. And to further highlight the state of the world, which the light of the world was born into, is the storyline immediately after the desert temptation. Matthew 4 and 24 says this, and his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers 
diseases and torments and those which were possessed with devils and those which were lunatics and those that had the palsy and he healed them and they followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan to illustrate the truth of how dark the world had gotten we find people from several countries following Jesus at the beginning of his three in a half year ministry, his early ministry, seeing that he was different but still following him for the same reason they sought out soothsayers. They were still following him for the same reason they sought out sorcerers and witches. They were still following him in order to try to get something from him. Oh my God, my God. Something that, that, that they were trying to get from him that they would, they would just as soon follow an evil demonic activity, an evil demon, a soothsayer, a sorcerer, a witch. And anticipating the birth of Jesus the Christ. Centuries before Mary met Gabriel, Isaiah wrote that the light that was coming into the world came to a people shrouded in darkness. Isaiah 9, 1 through 7. Gloom, anguish, and content with just some of the adjectives used to describe the darkness of the world at that time. To understand the fullness of of the revelation of the light which came into the world and when Christ was born, we need to recognize the darkness into which our Christ was born. We need to recognize and be able to really grasp and see. See, in today's world, people don't understand that demonic activity is really a real thing and it was more severe at that time before the coming of Christ and the Holy Spirit coming into the world. It was a very severe thing. It was a real serious thing that people took serious. Today, we consider seven aspects of the darkness, aspects not out of God's control, but rather sovereignty ordained of God, ordained through Christ. We want to consider so that we can realize that the brightness outshines the darkness by leaps and bounds, by leaps and bounds. Let me look at some things. The first is when Christ was born. The word of God had not been heard for four centuries, or so they say. Malachi, in the last book of the Old Testament, written in the 5th century B.C., it concludes with the statement that God would send Elijah the prophet as a forerunner for the Messiah. Uh, but since that last pregnant statement, which would eventually be fulfilled in John the Baptist, God had been silent, or so they say. And everyone knew that God had not spoken much, or was it God had spoken much, or were people not listening much? Oh, my God. Listen to some of the Jewish writers of the day as they said. A Babylonian historian stated this, after the later prophets Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi had died, the Holy Spirit departed from Israel, but they still availed themselves of the voice from heaven. They still resisted the voice from heaven. So God was speaking. The Jewish historian Josephus from, says, from Xerxes to our own time, a complete history has been written, but has not been deemed worthy of equal credit with the early records because of the failure of the exact succession of the prophets. In other words, God was still speaking, but for some reason, people were not recording what God was saying, and they were not taking what God was saying in a manner that was literal, so they call that time period the silent years. First Maccabees, which is a group of Christians, a group of uh, Jews, they said this, in First Maccabees, so they tore down the altar and stoned the stone and stored the stones in the convenient place on the hill top temple. There should there come a prophet to tell them what to do with this. In other words, the stones, the temple made stones, they had taken them down and they had placed them into storage. Without the word of God present among them, the people walked in spiritual darkness. Without the word of God present among them, they walked in spiritual darkness, walked in spiritual darkness. Second thing, the people of God were underneath the oppressive rule of the Roman Empire. This is evident in the birth story of Jesus. Luke 2 and 1 records the census taken by Caesar Augustus. 
Censuses in those days were really a show of power. It was a number of people. It wasn't like censuses today, which are supposed to be done in order to make sure that there's a, a fair and equitable distribution of resources. No, this census was done as a show of power. The people were first forced to return to their native cities, and when they got there, they had to bring tax for the privilege of coming. When you own or collect something, you count it. And then the census was also a blatant reminder to the people of Israel that they were owned by someone else. Likewise, the man Herod, King Herod, was on the throne at the birth of Christ. Herod the Great was a descendant of Edom. Uh, uh, Edom is also uh, the descendants of, of Esau. So long ago, long gone were the days of the Davidic king. Bethlehem was no longer a grand city. Jerusalem was no longer a grand city. It was a city underneath oppression. Oppression. In some ways, the Israelites had escaped exile. No, they no longer lived in Babylon. But in many ways, they were exiles in their own country. Even their own temple was built by a foreigner when Herod the Great built the temple. And Herod, of course, was a a descendant of a rival nation, so political darkness reigned in the country. Third, the nation of Israel was fracturing. It was falling apart. Four groups in Israel sought and fought to lead the people. The Pharisees resided in Jerusalem. They attempted to shape religious life in Israel through their tradition. Sadducees opposed the strict legalism of the Pharisees and only embraced the Mosaic law found in Genesis through Deuteronomy. They rejected the resurrection. They believed in the angels but still had an influential place in the temple and law courts. Then there's the Essenes who lived in a commune near Hormon. They were the scribes who penned and preserved the Dead Sea Scrolls. They lived an especially pure life. They devoted themselves to God and prayed for God's overthrow of the Roman Empire. Then there's the fourth group. The fourth group is the group that Judas Iscariot belonged to. The fourth group were called the Zealots. The Zealots were a band of brothers who did not pray for change so much as they sought a violent overthrow of the Roman rule. In other words, they, they came radical and said that by any means necessary, we will overthrow the Roman rule in this country, in the country of Israel. So we have here the results of four groups in fighting, fighting each other, Four competing sects in Judaism, which led to constant friction among the people. It only increased by the oppressive rule of Rome as each group sought a higher and higher position among the Romans and they would turn on each other in order to allow them to be on top. So as tensions were increasing, riots were commonplace in the country. Darkness permeated Judaism. And the fourth thing, the birth of Christ came through a virgin. Now in our days we celebrate, we celebrate Mary as an example of devotion and faith. We send Christmas cards with, with, with scenes of Mary and the baby Jesus on them and, and we sing songs praising God for this humble servant but it was not so then. Matthew 1 records that Joseph was a righteous man, a man who loved Mary, a, a man who who sought in order not to bring in shame to Mary for her pregnant state, uh, what he thought was pregnant out of wedlock. Uh, he sought to divorce her quietly. Why? Because everyone knows how a child is normally conceived. But this child wasn't conceived in the same manner because they didn't understand scripture. They did not understand prophecy. This child was born of a virgin, born an innocent life. Hallelujah. Mary's child would grow up in ridicule as the son of an unchastened woman as found in John 8 and 41. A virgin was not a celebrated event in ancient Israel. 
A virgin birth was not a celebrated event in ancient Israel, so darkness surrounded the birth of Christ. Fifth, the Romans to ensure that they reign supreme to ensure that those Jews knew that they were the ones who were in charge, uh, did not care that the, the census was a considerable imposition. They did not care. Uh, it was considerable imposition in times, terms of money, in terms of time. Uh, so, so living in Nazareth, Mary and Joseph lived more than a hundred miles north of Bethlehem. Yet there was no way around it. A hundred miles to us means absolutely nothing. We can travel in a matter of an hour or two. But a hundred miles back in that day through desert land, a hundred miles back in that day through land in which you may find bandits, a hundred miles in that day at a pace of probably no more than 15 miles per day with a pregnant wife. Uh, oh my God, my God. That was a very considerable imposition to be in. Amen. They did not have cars. They didn't have that cushion seats. They did not have suspension systems. So when they rode the mules, the donkeys, the camels, uh, uh, the teenage couple were forced to walk over hills. They were forced to walk through streams in the heat of the day. While we celebrate the pyramids today with an illuminated festival, it wasn't so with them. This was a very dark walk was the night before. The 16th, the party of Mary and Joseph did not fit the royal son that they had, man. My God, that just, just touches me every time I think of how the Lord allowed his only begotten son to be born into poverty so that he could come into our poverty, to our impoverished situation, and bring us into his riches. Amen. Amen. Oh, my God. My God. So so the 16, the poverty of Mary and Joseph, did not fit the royal son they had. Not only were the conditions leading up to Christ's birth dark, but so too was his birth. Luke 2 and 7 records that there was no place for them in the end. This is probably because it was filled with travelers coming who had more means who were coming into Jerusalem into uh, uh, Bethlehem for the census. But it may also be the case that Joseph, a carpenter by trade, did not have the means to pay for a room. Did not have means to pay for a room. Money talks. But it's clear that Joseph had no bargaining power. Mary and Joseph went to the stable, and some accounts they call it a cave, literally a cave, where Jesus was born, where Jesus was among the animals, where Jesus was laid in a manger without family, without hospitality, uh, uh, without, without the love that normally surrounds the birth of a child. Our Lord and Savior was born in the manger, in the field of an animal trough, literally born in a manger. My God, my God, my God. The seventh thing. Through the forces hostile of Herod, through the forces hostile, through the hostile forces of Herod, Satan tried to kill Jesus. Satan didn't know. It shows you that he doesn't know everything. So in order to get to our Lord and Savior, he opted in order to, uh, to get to our Lord and Savior, he opted to kill every child of a certain age. He opted to kill every child of a certain age. Amen. Amen. So, so poverty was not the only source of darkness. The darkness of the hearts of the people was also a source of darkness. Persecutions uh, that followed after the birth of Jesus uh, uh, is recorded in Matthew 2. And, and it's also recorded in the Old Testament where it talks about Rachel crying for the children that were lost because of the tyranny of a very jealous, a very undermined, a very evil king. Matthew 2 records the detail. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, this Herod the great, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Well, we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So, in other words, they saw the star when it rose. So, we don't know if it was several months or several years. Most theologians say it was several years. They followed this star from the east until that star settled over that place that Jesus was. My God, my God, my God. When King Herod heard this, he was troubled. And all 
all of Jerusalem with him. Now I can understand Herod being troubled because he really wasn't the king. But the children of God being troubled, that's a true sign that there was something really wrong. They shouldn't have been troubled when they heard the Messiah had been born. They should be joyous. They should be full of hope. They should be full of peace. They should not have been troubled. But when you are not in right standing, when righteousness stands before you or comes before you, you can be troubled in your spirit. Oh, my God, my God. So Herod gathered up the priest. He gathered up all of the people of the land, the chief priests and the scribes, the people who knew the law. And he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So Herod was so paranoid for his own position in power that he had multiple family members killed. Oh, my God, my God. And he attempted to use the wise men to lead him to the Christ child, not to worship as he tried to tell them, but to exterminate, to destroy, to remove. When he learns that the wise men had avoided him, they, they had not complied with his scheme, he orders the execution of all the children, all the males of a certain age in and around Bethlehem. Yes, he was an evil man. Matthew 2 and 16 says, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became fierce, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and all in that region who were two years or under, two years old or under, according to the time that he ascertained from the wise men. So the wise men may have been traveling for up to two years. This speaks of the prophecy in Jeremiah 31 and 15. Thus said the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentations and bitter weeping. Rachel, weeping for her children, refused to be comfort for her children because they were not. But there is also good news even in the midst of darkness. There's good news even in today in the midst of darkness. There was good news even then in the midst of darkness. The good news that is that is prevalent in our lives even today. The good news out of great darkness. Night which was until his birth described better as silent night, evil night, instead of silent night, holy night. Darkness is everywhere in Christ's birth, which should not come as a surprise when we think of the prophecies in the Old Testament and the conditions of the world that God had created at that time, that they had, had the world had come into a certain place. As John 1 says, the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world, but yet the world did not know him, did not know him. When we consider that Christ came into the darkness in order to bring light. The truth is staggeringly beautiful. Beautiful despite that we fail to live up who we're called to be on a daily basis. That begs the question why? Why is it because we often live totally contrary to the word of God. We want to take the word of God and live our own term. But it's not that type of term. We must live according to the word of God. Not according to the words of our flesh because our flesh will surely lead us to hell. Hallelujah. My God, my God. The Lord spoke to the woman at the well in John 4 and 23. He said, those that worship him must do so in spirit and in truth. We must say, we say we know what that means, but we continue to fail to worship him in spirit and in truth. We have a form of godliness, but we deny the power thereof. Spiritual references, spirit, spirit references our reverence of God, whilst truth is what your flesh should be subject to. Oh, my God, my God. Truth should make the flesh die daily. Truth will not allow you to flaunt your sin before God and then have the nerve to say, Lord, bless my mess. Truth will convict you and allow Holy Spirit the only place in your life instead of having him having a perch he will have full reign in your life too many have a salvation sunday but a moody monday they have a trashy tuesday a weak wednesday a terrible thursday a freaky friday a sinful saturday i know there are too many who are falling by the wayside because they're allowing the darkness of this world to be their way we should have a salvation sunday morning but we should have a salvation throughout the week. We should constantly, the flesh has to die daily. 
has to die daily. We should have a salvation Sunday morning called some when they walk out the door. That is the extent of their relationship with the Lord. When they walk out the door on Sunday morning, out of church on Sunday morning, that's the extent of their relationship with the Lord. Then they go forth and they go and do Lord knows whatever on Sunday afternoon when they go to ball games and all kinds of other things. When they turn to worshiping the football team they love or basketball, baseball, or whatever sports they love. Amen. We are called to walk out of darkness. Was the night before. As I say, it was the night before. I also consider it was well, the coming of the Lord Jesus is coming real soon. The Lord will soon crack the sky. This is the night before the dark. All the things that are born in this world, this is the night before the dark. This is the night before the dark. The terrible things going on in the world, the killings, the, the, the murders, the burglars, the things that are born in this world that are purely straight from the satanic pits of hell is a dark time that we live in. But this is a time period where the Lord can save to the utmost. God is not concerned about how dark it is in the world. He's concerned about the light reaching your heart. He's concerned about the light coming on the inside of you. He's concerned about how you walk your walk out with him. Amen. If we're going to be salt and light in the world, then we must have flavor. We cannot be dark and have light because we'll be half lit. Uh, uh, when you pronounce Christ, people need to know that you are living the life that you pronounce because the Lord is pulling the veil off of so many people who are lying, who are who are disagreeing with the walk that they should have in Christ. Amen. If your talk does not line up with your walk, then you are wrong. My God, my God. Hallelujah. If you have lamp without the oil, you have lamp without the oil, and there's nothing light. There's nothing to light. Therefore, you are without light. You are without light. We all face seasons of darkness. This has been a very dark year for many of us. The Lord knows exactly how we feel. He came in the flesh, but he was not of the flesh. He knows the pain. He knows the sorrows. He knows the agonies. He knows the, the things that challenge us on a daily basis. He knows. He knows. He knows. He knows. He knows. Hallelujah. He knows. Hebrews 4 and 15 lets us know that. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. But was in all points tempted like we are yet without sin. Our excuse that Jesus doesn't know is hard to fall on these ears because he knows. He knows. We must remember the light of Christ came into darkness and we must come into darkness ourselves and be the light in the midst of darkness. To God Almighty be the glory. Amen. Beloved, it's my prayer if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. This is a time where you can get to know him as your Lord and Savior. Not just as your Lord because he's Lord of all regardless. Hallelujah. Not just as your Savior because he's the Savior to anyone who accepts him. But the combination of Lord and Savior is what we should be seeking. Hallelujah. You don't have to live the way that you're living. You can come out of that darkness into his marvelous light. Hallelujah. I know you've tried many things. you tried many ways to circumvent, but you cannot get around him. You cannot get around the light, and no one comes to the Father except for coming through him. So, beloved, and that if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's a simple prayer. Father, forgive me. I'm sorry for the way I have lived my life up to this point. Speak the words from your heart, Lord. I accept Jesus as my Lord. I renounce the things of this world. And you place it all underneath the name of Jesus as a reminder to the Lord God who does not forget, but as a reminder to him, I'm doing this in your son's name. If you did that, welcome to the family. 
Hallelujah. Glory unto God. Beloved, my prayers that you have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Christmas. And that the Lord continue to bless you and keep you even in the new year. To God Almighty be the glory. You can be a blessing to the ministry by going to our cash app, which is dollar sign interceding CC, or going to the Google or the Apple store and download the Giveify app. Look and see the beautiful picture of my wife, First Lady Tina Schaefer, and be a blessing to the ministry in that way. Amen. God bless you. I love you with the love of Christ. Amen. Christian Center, we hope that you felt welcome from the time that you entered into the house of the Lord. Come and receive His holy word. If you are a guest, be blessed. Interceding Christian Center has a God-given desire to minister to the total person.